I'm Ryan from the Dad.io podcast, a show dedicated to dorky dads everywhere. Part of the Gonna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other dadalicious geeky shows at gonnageeknetwork.com. Welcome to Play Comics, where I grab a guest, we talk about a video game based on a comic, even if you never knew it was based on a comic, because the comic is really weird and obscure, but despite where you have seen the media from, yeah, we're leaving that awkwardness in because today I am talking to Christian Cabrera, and we are looking at Men in Black Crash Town. Christian, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing pretty good right now. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm excited to be looking at this because do you ever get enough Men in Black? Oh my god, that dude, Men in Black takes me back to my childhood so much, man. Uh, I remember the movie when it came out. I remember the series watching it as a kid. And funny enough too, I actually did play this game, but I played it on PS2 because since it was backwards compatible with PlayStation games, I was able to play it that way. It's the best thing PlayStation ever did. Uh, I know backwards compatibility. Why don't you keep it in all your systems? I don't even want to think about how much extra it would have cost a PS5 to be able to play everything, but I did definitely appreciate that PS3s could play PS1. Oh yeah, especially if you had the, uh, I think it was the second gen fat model, I think it was the 80 gig one with the opening uh, compartment for all your cards. That one specifically did it, like, and it ran it really well. I used to have one of those until it broke. <laughs> Oh, nice. I just randomly ran across the memory card readers like twice at the flea market and whoever had them had no idea what they were. So it was like five bucks. Oh, wow. Uh, those are it. those are like kind of worth a pretty penny too, depending on like the yep, what you're trying to run with. never leaving me. Oh, you struck gold, my friend. Yes. I'm glad you <laughs> mentioned the Men in Black series too, because that is what this game is based on. And somehow growing up, I don't know what happened. I just never really watched the Men in Black series because I guess I'm that much of a loser. <laughs> oh, man. I'm surprised that you don't remember watching or actually ever seen the advertisements for it. They did it consistently on the, the Kids WB, and most of the shows that were on Kids WB were actually some really good television growing up back in the day in, in the mid to like late 90s into going into the 2000s. And the Men in Black series was one of those ones specifically that was, it was different from all the other ones because it was an actual like high valued property that was by Warner Brothers, which is the Men in Black uh, movies, which it's crazy to have a tie in from a movie to turn into an actual like television show like that. It's rare on those occasions that I've seen before, even growing up as a kid, but this one worked differently since it's an alternate timeline of the Men in Black series, which it was not too bad, to be honest. So that time frame for me was middle school going into high school. I might have been too busy trying to play baseball. I was not very good at it, but I did it anyway. So th I mean, honestly, that was probably what the problem was for me in watching this. That makes sense. I mean, I was an indoor kid most of the time. I actually didn't get into athletics until I got into like end of my middle school into high school. But I mean, this came out around the time when I was still in elementary school. I mean, honestly, this show specifically and the fact that like I got to see something that was of this style specifically and during that time block in the early mornings, it's really good. I mean, for a lot of people that don't know the Men in Black actual animated series, this thing came around in October of like 1997 and it ended its run in like 2001. It's four seasons long. And uh, surprisingly, it's very good. And there's a lot of very notable voice actors actually in this actual series that a lot of people, if you actually listen to it today, you would actually understand like who was actually in the actual series, which is actually pretty cool. 
See, now you just got me curious about who's in there. Well, you you have you seen the the movie? The first one? I have definitely seen the movies. Not the newest one, but I've seen all the other ones. Okay, so you've seen all the other ones. Okay, so you know how Tony Shalhoub is uh, Jeebs in the in the show or in the yep. movie? He was Jeebs for like the first season. And then another famous voice actor that we all know to this day, Mr. Billy West, took over from seasons two to four. Oh, we have Billy West can just do anything. I know, right? <laughs> and then um, I think the other one was Kirkwood Smith. I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Uh, Red Foreman. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, so he played one of the agents, too, in the TV show. He... Didn't have didn't have a really prominent role in the series, but yeah, he was also in it as well. Just looking through the list of people on here, obviously they're not going to get Will Smith. He's he would have wanted too much money for this, most likely. But you've got a pretty nice voice cast in here. It's very it's a very prominent voice cast, and a lot of these people are still doing work to this day. Like honestly. You've got like he, Vincent D'Onofrio, whose name I just destroyed. Mm -hmm. You've got D. Bradley Baker and Jess Hartnell. I really need to go back and watch this now. You should. Like, honestly, it's... I don't know how well it holds up today, because I have recently have seen an episode or two. Some of the context of it is still pretty relevant to, essentially, the entire universe of the Men in Black series. And some of it is very, very dated information that kind of gives you. So, I mean, it's still pretty good to this day. Even the theme song. The theme song is probably by far one of my most favorite ones from a, a non-actual like licensed show or an actual licensed show that I mean to say. So what was it that got you into Men in Black in the first place? I mean, to be fair, it had to be the movie. The movie, the first movie when it first came out, it was so iconic when it came out. Uh, we had Will Smith essentially, like I think that was his third movie now that he was in after Independence Day. I want to say, I want to say it was that one. And then the fact that we had Tommy Lee Jones, who I've seen Tommy Lee Jones movies when I was a kid too, because my dad like introduced me to a bunch of these other movies. On top of that, and the fact that like it dealt with aliens, and most kids loved aliens when they were younger and stuff like that. I loved aliens. I've read alien stories all the time. That's and that entire small amount of like media that I got from there got me into wanting to watch it. And it's also cartoons because I mean kids love cartoons. And I that's all I did is to watch cartoons. I watched the random animes that they would show on there as well. And of course, it's like I might as well add another show to my repertoire when I was a kid. Just like so wake up early in the morning on Saturdays to come watch something. Well, I guess according to you, I'm still a kid then because I still like alien stuff and cartoons. Hell yeah. I mean, I still too, too, but <laughs> I'm just using that as a uh, frame of reference. <laughs> Maybe when we grow up, we'll stop liking those, but we aren't grown up yet, so it doesn't matter. Impossible, because I still like Star Trek and Star Wars. <laughs> so how long did it take you to realize that Men in Black was a comic? Not until I got older. I didn't realize it was a comic until I think it was during my when I was in college that's around the time when I realized it was a comics book series until someone told me that I might have had people tell me beforehand but I think when it really um, stuck in my brain was when I was putting the list together for this show yeah and I just looked at it and went holy crap Men in Black is a comic yeah, it took me a while to realize that it also was a comic book series. I mean, I never honestly, I never thought like a lot of the stuff that I enjoyed today came from comic books or they came from some sort of other media specifically. And I mean, until you start doing your own research and then boom, it appears right in front of you. Like, oh, it was a comic series. Oh, man. So have you had a chance to look at the comics at all? To be honest, I didn't. I think the last time I actually take a look at one of them was probably I think it was like in the 2010s. That was like the last time I saw him because I, it didn't pique my interest. I think after that, I was more invested in the, and the actual like, the more of the TV shows, the movies, and also like, the random games that they actually had on top of that. You're not missing much. I mean, it's it's good for what it mm -hmm. is. It's definitely not a central reading for anything. Hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Is there anything specific though in the comics that you've seen on there that like? kind of was a little more interesting than, than the or a specific 
like storyline they could have used in one of the show maybe in like a tv show series or uh, in a movie um i mean it mostly it was just doing things in a way that you can do in a comic that you can't really do in a movie i mean they probably could have pulled it off in the cartoon and they might have pulled it off in the cartoon i don't know because i'm the one who didn't watch it but <laughs> i mean you just get a little bit more um freedom from physics in a comic since you don't have to worry about things silly things like gravity and people getting hurt understandable yeah and aliens don't have to actually be made to look good because you can just draw them that too and then you have more freedom of like creating something different than out of something else that's already been essentially made on top of that like you can't make something look kind of similar to like a Klingon and Star Trek to, to pretty much put in Men in Black so you kind of kind of tweak a little bit of the art style for that <laughs> yeah so you mentioned that the cartoon is kind of like an alternate timeline from the movies tell me more about that because now I'm really mad I didn't watch this show before Essentially, it takes place around the time when Jay is a rookie. Like, it's like around his first month on the job of that. And he, of course, he gets paired up with Kay. Like, like normally, like how it starts out in the movies. The only difference is that this is more case by case of all the stuff that they're doing. More than it of the overarching plot of, like, essentially trying to stop big disaster that's been happening the entire time. It literally, it leads up to that specifically, but that takes so much time for that to happen they have reoccurring characters that always make appearances they always talk to it's like this it's still set in the place of new york the, the way how it was in the movies the only difference that it has on there it's the fact that you learn more about other aliens that are there specifically trying to solve the cases of specific like disappearances uh random murders homicides all that stuff it's literally is a cop drama for it being a kid show which i think is pretty strange and essentially it gives you more of your the origin stories of like how like K became part of Men in Black as well. Because we learned in the movies that he essentially went to like a little site that happened and the aliens came out from a ship and he gave them flowers. Well, that part Kip was a little more deeper in the actual television show. They actually gave you more of the backstory of why he was there. Why did he have flowers there? And the fact that like, why is it that it had to be those aliens specifically there and that's the cool part about that that happened i believe it was either in the first season or second season i remember exactly where it was but this the crazy part about it too is the fact that they had older k for like the first season and then they had like a little time loop and they had a younger k out of nowhere take his place he essentially was like sent to like a different like reality he was presumed dead on that part but a younger k ended up taking over he's like well i'm not gonna make the same mistake as like my older self so i'm gonna learn from my mistakes on top of that but it it goes down a bunch of crazy little routes because you meet you meet the same usual characters you normally do but then they have different backstories of what it was like for instance l l wasn't a mortician how it was in the movie she was just like a, a bystander and i know where she ended up coming in and essentially just like working with them on top of that like she did tech technically she did still have the mortician actual like job title but it didn't go off on that at all they never really did anything on top of that and then on, and also the main villain was alpha who was like the very first agent that they ever had he just essentially was like he was essentially the main big bad the entire way you hear him once in a while throughout a few episodes and then he comes out essentially being bigger and badder as it is and you start realizing that hey they have to stop this guy specifically so it eventually led up to all that just so they can get a final showdown with alpha oh that sounds so cool it is i mean especially alpha in general as a character is really good because he essentially he, he knows everything about the mib he knows everything and the fact that like he went rogue he started using alien technology and he started using alien dna on himself to essentially mutate himself to become a more powerful being it's very shonen-esque in my eyes when you ever see that because then when you actually watch the show you're like oh you can see that there's a lot of like also anime influence on top of that from this a men in black anime would be insane i don't know how if they'd be able to pull that off licensing stuff seems like it would be a nightmare well i mean they did do uh, a bunch of marvel stuff uh, anime style ones as well they did like iron man they did a wolverine one i think they did an x-men one on top of that 
I don't remember exactly how many they did, but they've done those types of properties before. So I guess the big question here is, do you think this is one of the shows that might be in for a reboot? Because it seems like mm. they're rebooting everything these days. They are rebooting a lot of things, uh, but to be honest, if they ever did reboot this series, right now actually would not be a good time to reboot it after the recent flop of the latest Men in Black movie because that would actually kind of diminish what people want to see because since that one kind of did pretty bad in the box office and it really wasn't a big a big hit as a lot of people wanted it to be <laughs> excuse me uh coming coming up with that one again and rebooting it probably would not be a good idea because a lot of people probably would not be interested in it unless you're like very nostalgic like me i would want to rewatch it again i mean i've rewatched a bunch of television shows movies I've reread comic book series too that I I really loved back in the day, and still to this day I I like to do a lot a lot of that stuff on top of that. But to be honest, if they ever do reboot this, it won't pique a lot of people's interest. Well, I'm gonna find my little memory of racy flashy ray thing and try to make TV executives forget about the entire idea of reboots as we drop a few promos for some other shows. Hell yeah, Neuralizer. Gravity Beer Productions, in association with the Podfix Network, is proud to bring you Armchair Radio, an interactive sports and pop culture podcast. Each episode, we analyze past and upcoming matchups, discuss the latest headlines from the world of sports, and give you the fantasy tips you need to win your league. But that's not all. We want you involved. Join us as we pick games each week. Submit your picks and see who comes out on top at the end of the season. Or call the Armchair Radio hotline and let us know what's on your sports brain. Follow us on Twitter at Team Armchair. Call the hotline at 405-785-0355. And subscribe anywhere fine podcasts are sold. It's Armchair Radio from Gravity Beard, the absolute best source for sports news, game analysis, fantasy tips, and more. Behold, comic book adaptations. Yes, from the biggest blockbuster movie to the latest Netflix drama, it seems like anything that's worth its weight in back issues these days is based on a comic book. But all that variety can get a little overwhelming, right? So how do you tell the good from the bad? The DC from the D-, the MCU from the just PU? Well, that's where Behold comes in. I'm Andrew, and joined by my co-hosts Rob and Mick, we try to answer once and for all what is the best comic book adaptation? Yes, be it movie or TV show, we'll watch it and rank it until we have our definitive number one. Tune in every fortnight and find out where your favourite ranks, which shows are worth the investment, and just exactly how many movies based on comics there really are. That's Behold, B-E-H-O-L-D, exclamation mark, available on iTunes, Spotify, and all of the good podcast apps. Those were some great shows to check out, but first let's finish up with this one. Uh, so Christian, you mentioned that you had played this game before. What was and when was your first experience with this one? So my first experience with this thing was when um, still renting video games at like Blockbuster and stuff like that. <laughs> I came across this one when I think it was like around 2002, I believe it was, because they still had older games in the Blockbuster sections when I used to you know, all the time. I used to rent one for the weekend every single time with my family. And I would put it on my PS2 because it's still backwards compatible. And the first time I booted that thing up, I realized it was a pretty decent looking game when I was a kid. I mean, to be honest, like most of us growing up, knowing seeing the video games we had, we're like, oh man, some of the stuff was graphically amazing. <laughs> and nowadays, everything looks amazing. Way better than it was back in the day. But I mean, it's... When you booted up that game, you get this, the standard PlayStation logo, like the most iconic thing that pops up every single time. And then once you start the game, right at the menu screen, you see the twin, one of the twins just typing in on, on their, their usual giant supercomputer that they always do right in, in the actual like movie. And man, that thing is actually pretty cool that they incorporated that on top of that. It, that was actually pretty nice. I'm not going to lie. And then, of course, once you actually start up the game, you got to pick a name for your character and all that stuff, like the normal, the normal nilly dilly stuff that you got to do. And then the game actually starts up and you get 
a cutscene that almost looks like it's from the TV show, but very claymation-y, like, since our, since the rendering software for a lot of that stuff was really bad back in the day, but it was, it was still passable. <laughs> and the voice actors were not the same on top of that, but character-wise and movement-wise and aesthetic-wise, it was exactly the same, which I find was very, very interesting. Because the fact that they kept almost everything original how the way they wanted to. But then once you actually start out the game, the game is a very different, different story. <laughs> yeah, like the graphics here and stuff, this is what I grew up on. This is when I really started playing. So these graphics never bothered me for anything. And anybody who, you know, they look at it now, if you're like a 12 year old now, yeah, they look like crap. But you're also growing up in a world where PS4 is the oldest thing that you've ever played on. So, you know, you got to give it a little bit of slack. This is a PS1. I do. No, I, I give it some slack as well. I mean, I've played retro games most of my life as it is. I think still one of my favorite games to go back to to this day is still Mega Man 2. Mega Man 2 is a masterpiece, like honestly. if Out of all the retro games, that's probably number one on my list as like being the greatest game of all time, like to be honest. This game, if I were to rank this game in like a top 100s or a top 1000, probably will not even crack any of that spot. It'll probably be in like maybe 5000s, honestly. This game, this game does not hold up very well. It's very, very dated and it's also very, how can I put it this way? There's a specific little mechanic in newer games now which is called aim assisting this game holds your hand all the way through like it really does there is no real challenge in this game there's no complexity to what you're doing in this game and there's also i gotta put it this way there's very minimal characters and enemies to fight in this game like to be honest <laughs> It was great for the time when it came out, which is phenomenal because it's at the height of what the Men in Black series was. But this game in general was very, <laughs> oh man, it is not great anymore. <laughs> now, this one came out in 2001. It's about the time of Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro, just to give people a little bit of a time frame reference there. Developed by RuneCraft, we haven't looked at any games from them on the show at all yet. So this is the first one there and published by Infograms, where we've looked at Dragon Ball Z Ultimate Battle 22, Tintin Prisoners of the Sun, and the Smurfs. So this isn't their first PS1 game that they did. And, you know, they'd been doing games for a little bit, so it, they should have known what they were doing. Whether they knew is a whole different issue. Yeah, and that's the thing about like some of these older companies. Like I've heard of RuneCraft, for one specific game only because that was probably the only other game I've played from that company and that is Matt Hoffman's Pro BMX <laughs> like that game was actually not a bad game when it first came out it's very dated to this day because it's it doesn't hold up very well on top of that and then there is one other game I mean there is one other game I did play in there but I didn't really play it that often the Soldier of Fortune was another one because that was also known as like a very bloody and gruesome game that they've actually made which is it holds better on pc than it did on the actual console that was out on i believe it was dreamcast when that one came out i believe so i want to say i'm not 100 percent sure but i mean runecraft they didn't last very long i remember that they didn't last long at all they're not a household name they're more of a they were more of like a nostalgia name but they don't have anything that's worth mentioning that's actually really phenomenal the only other thing I would even mention, because I cheated and pulled up a uh, list of what they've made, is they did some of the Spec Ops games. And everything else that I would even want to mention to anybody, you already said. Yeah. <laughs> I only know of like the Matt Hoffman one because the only reason why I know of RuneCraft is because of that. I never even knew that the, they made the Men in Black series until like I redid some research again on it. But that's the only reason why I know about them, because they're the everyone has their most iconic logos whenever they start up the thing. Like whenever you saw Tony Hawk, you saw Neversoft. It was the eyeball spear going right through it. That's very iconic. You know where that's from. You know it's Neversoft. 
but with runecraft it essentially it's you sow runecraft and then like it shatters into like a bunch of different pieces of stone like everywhere that's when you know like that's how you knew runecraft that's when i know it was from matt hoffman's because that's was like the first thing that popped up from it and maybe their lack of skill is why we haven't seen anything from them since 2002 man only a year after this game came out man that's not long no maybe they got neuralized <laughs> nice pun right there i love that so as longtime listeners of the show should know this game already kind of gets off on a bad foot for me because it's a first person shooter um i really try not to hold that against things but when it comes to first person shooters i end up having to watch playthrough videos more than playing it because i just i'm not good at them i can't get into them and i figure that's the best way for me to not just be frustrated with the fact that i can't get anywhere in it here's the thing though like this thing came out in was it like 2001 almost close to 2002 but there is one other like fps that came out probably like a couple years before that or even a year before i think it was uh the first medal of honor game came out and that game for it being a first person shooter was surprisingly very well done and the thing is that one specifically had you actually try to target your specific character like target your specific enemies and actually shoot them this game though like i said it's very aim assist it'll show it'll point to the character and then out of nowhere it'll automatically start aiming to the actual enemy that you're trying to fight you see the little box that is on there and within like three or four shots they die but in medal of honor it's like that they actually kind of judge you on precision when it comes to shooting your the gun at a, a specific character so this one specifically is was pretty much teaching is like well we'll hold your hand the entire way and just like you know essentially this is gonna be a fun experience which I, it wasn't much of a fun experience to be honest but medal of honor is like it's a way older game but it did fps's correctly the way how i feel that this game could have done although on the other hand if this is based off of a cartoon which i guess is at least nominally for children whether that happened or not is a whole different issue then the target audience for the game is probably skewing it a little bit lower even if it is rated t mm -hmm. which i think is just a little bit weird that you're gonna make a t-rated game off of a kid's cartoon but whatever <laughs> so maybe they had it in there because they knew a bunch of little kids would be playing it and they didn't want them to get all frustrated and quit which is true i understand that i mean the thing is like a lot of older games were pretty difficult back in the day most of the time it would take a while to do that sometimes it'll frustrate the people they won't even play them anymore the fact that this one actually did held your hand the entire way i can see why it might have appealed very well to children because it's like they wanted they played a game they beat it and anytime a kid beats a game they feel very accomplished and they feel like they they can do anything after that which is great but this one in today's standards this game would probably be shunned hard than what it actually would have been back in the day from what i've seen from everything it's a fairly short game i know one review i was watching said it took them like four hours to beat it which i mean when you can save and everything that's not bad i mean for the standards of what it was and especially around that time there's been a bunch of other games that have been you can play way longer than that one though like i feel that that one's probably one of the shortest games i think i've ever seen especially in the repertoire of like playstation games because i mean we've had final fantasy 7 we had final fantasy 8 we've had medal of honor medal of honor takes like almost 20 hours to beat for it being a really small game like final fantasy like i said legend of dragoon was another one that's like those are all really long games and even like gex gex was also one of those like plat older platformer 3d ones that were pretty they were fun back in the day that one also takes like 20 hours to beat on top of that like the fact that this one was so short i mean i kind of feel that that was probably was the target for it specifically to be short since it was a kid's game because you know most kids lose attention after like a certain amount of time which makes sense but it's the fact that like this just seems like a this seems like a cop out like how we also had like in this current generation too when they make games really short too for us paying full price on them on top of that like this one probably would have ended up setting that trend back then how it is today on top of that oh i definitely think the shortness here is both on purpose and a good thing because i don't think people would have finished it as much if it was a 20-hour game 
I see what you're coming from on that. I, I, I understand that. But it's also the fact that, like, if you bought this game new, and a lot of PlayStation games were, like, $40 back then, and an equivalence to that, to, like, today's market, it's, like, almost 70 bucks if you think about it that way. It's, like, for it being four hours long, it's, like, that doesn't really... It doesn't add up very well, and it doesn't have very good high replay ability on top of that. Like, honestly. I might be being skewed a little bit by the fact that I literally bought this game for a dollar from somebody who had it in a Celine Dion CD case at the flea market. <laughs> oh, man, you were, you got ripped off, man. I would have taken the Celine Dion CD instead. Well, I, if I'm remembering right, they, that was also the one where I got a, a completed box copy of Silent Hill. Oh. So, yeah, I'm okay. Oh yeah, then never mind. You came up on top. Silent Hills, like even okay, I forgot to mention that even Silent Hill that came out on PlayStation and that game was still longer. Like honestly, come on. One thing I like here though, we're working around their graphical limitations. Um, if you had had all kinds of dead alien bodies sitting around, then that would have taken up so much texture memory and just mm-hmm. so much slowdown. So I did appreciate the fact that they just had everything blow up. I did too, like, to be honest, and especially, and most of, like, a lot of older games too, because I've seen videos of what how, what would happen if, like, for instance, Doom, if Doom's body parts were still on the ground the entire way and all stacked up, piled up, it'll definitely limit the amount of, like, latency the game can actually go through, and it'll slow it down hard. It could even crash the game, which is pretty insane if you think about that on top of that it's just actually not too bad that the fact that there's a reason why they do these things specifically in games because so it's since the limitations that they have and also they don't want to actually you know destroy their actual game on top of that <laughs> oh man how bad would that be if you had a game that just crashed this old from something like that that you couldn't really do anything about because it's not like today where they can just patch it true but also a lot of the older games of course were on cdrs and those, and as soon as you get a scratch on one of those things, your game is gone. There's no way of actually recovering that. At least nowadays we have digital, which makes it easier for us to store it somewhere. And we know for a fact it probably won't crash unless there's the latest patch update. But with this one, it's like, as soon as you scratch that disc, you're done. There's nothing else you can do about that. You have to go buy a new one. RIP my first copy of Xenogears. Oh no. That's a cl- that's a classic right there, actually. It's okay. I ended up getting like five more because people kept throwing them into even out trades. Oh, nice. Yeah, we come on top again. Yeah, for a while it was just I need to finish make this trade and even value. Would you like Xeno Gears? And I was just kind of kept getting them to see how many I could get. You are a uh, barter of our time now, sir. <laughs> Gotta love it. So another thing I kept noticing looking at the game is everybody seems the game is really front heavy with the quality of it. So you get your aliens there and your really cool menu. You get your fairly decent introduction and you get your really cool carnival level at the beginning and then everything else after that is just kind of meh. Yeah, the carnival level is probably the only one that's probably the most creative looking one. That full playthrough of the carnival probably takes about 15, 20 minutes, but it's very aesthetically pleasing. It's, you're going to a carnival ride, you're shooting aliens while in there, and then the way how the atmosphere in that entire level, it just feels like you're inside of like an either someone's body or an, or an alien body. And the randomness that happens in between a lot of stuff that's there going up and down through tunnels, cutting through small little corridors on top of that. And then there's like an eye shooting like a late shooting laser beams at you too. It's actually that first level was probably by far the best one. Like it really is the best level, but everything else after that is pretty cookie cutter the entire way. And then all the, like I said earlier, all the enemies are the exact same. There really isn't that much diversity in the, in the actual like enemies in general. And then the level designs become very cookie cutter and they're so simple and Honestly, the the only redeeming quality I would probably say is the way how you reload your gun or recharge it. Just go up to one of the stations and just shoot it and then it'll start recharging your gun. It's actually pretty cool because that's actually 
a specific thing in men in black the actual series itself because they're all energy weapons they're not actual like they take cartridges and stuff like that it's literally like an energy pellet or something and they just reattach it and it, and it recharges again it's actually pretty cool I love those little touches like that when people can take a part of your series that is actually different from everything else fit it into your game in a way that makes sense and not only do you have your connection to the source material there you also have an aspect of your game that's not like everybody else so it's not like you're looking at metal of call of duty ops whatever I don't even know most of those games, so I can't string anything else together. <laughs> yeah, insert generic shooter. That's essentially what you're pretty much saying. It, it, the fact that this game doesn't do those specific elements, it's actually pretty interesting. Not many games can set themselves apart from being a standard cookie cutter, like if it was a Metal Bonner, like if it was a Call of Duty, uh, or even like Metal Gear Solid too, because there's a lot of games that copy all those specific games and their formulas of how they play out and all that stuff. This one cheated itself it was different yes it cheated in in the aspects of like the way how the gameplay is played since it made it so easy but yes it's also something that a lot of other games didn't really do what they had which having the aim assist the only other game i can think of it was this arcade shooter i think it was called uh, i was like police police not police academy it's it did the same thing what this one did. I just forgot what it was, but this one was just an actual arcade with like an actual light gun. I just forgot the name of it. It is the same exact style. Oh, there's so many of those it could have been. Yeah, I know it's not like Time Crisis, but Time Crisis actually did hinder you if you miss your aims. We'll worry about that later. That's not important. No, it isn't. We'll think of it right after we stop recording, I bet. Yeah, right. So just looking at this game as a whole, what does it really get right about Men in Black? I mean, especially compared to the cartoon. The beginning wackiness of some of the earlier cutscenes, it has the same, almost the same feel of it as if it was from the TV show. The characters almost sound exactly like the ones from the show. Granted, it's you know it's coming from playstation one so like voice acting in playstation one isn't really great <laughs> to be honest but it gives you that feel that you are actually playing a men in black game if you didn't have those cutscenes, it would feel like a standard like shooter like it would have but since you actually have shown that hey this is you know this is the cutscene this shows zed talking to agent k and agent j about hey there we have some possible like aliens trying to either get out of uh, out of their jurisdiction I need you to go and stop them you know for a fact that's what it's from you see exactly where it's coming from and you see exactly the main mission of that is almost the exact same thing as if you were watching an episode of Men in Black on top of that and all those little um, ancillary things I think are maybe the only way to get a first person shooter to really feel like a property because you're not walking around seeing the character and at least with most of the ones that I've put any kind of real time in, I mean, the only real way to tell what they are is who the enemies are. Like, Turok has dinosaurs. This has aliens. Other things have aliens too, so aliens could be anything. But the cutscenes, the menu selection, everything like that is really what cements it Men in Black for me. I feel that those ones took the longest amount of time and you can see that they put so much effort into a lot of that which was great because that shows that they were kind of dedicated to making sure that this game came out great they wanted it to be aesthetically pleasing to the people that really did enjoy the series and also they wanted to keep it almost if it was original to if it this could have been an actual episode on top of that or even in a small arc from the actual show which I, I give them props for that. Like, honestly, I really do give them props. Most other gaming companies will essentially just make up their own story. They, they have the property of that. They'll just use it for some other stuff. But these, it just seems that they actually wanted to make it as if it was coming straight from an actual episode itself. And if it was actually written by the writers for that actual show on top of that. What do you think this game really gets wrong compared to the show? <sighs> To be honest, like what it did wrong in this game, 
probably would be how linear the gameplay actually is it's very it's very standard just walk walk a certain direction go to that checkpoint kill a couple enemies you're done a, a lot of games have done that during that era as well but there's also some that has done multiple other things where you have multiple objectives on top of that this one was just straight linear go here go there it's over next level go here go there next level done yeah honestly if this had a little bit extra stuff to it on top of that like for instance oh there's an agent that needs to be rescued go rescue the agent and find a way to get him to the exits like protect them almost like how gold and i did it with i think the character's name was natalia that you had to like escort her out of that which was really bad so you can add an escort mission to that thing on top of it even though escort mission is probably the biggest gaming sin because everyone hates escort missions to be honest but even if they add something like that at least it was different from a standard first person shooter that would actually would have made it a little bit more appealing to what i feel that it would have actually made the game a bit better yeah, and the only other thing I can think of is, like we've already hit on, the lack of diversity in the enemies. I mean, Men in Black does not have, here's your three races of aliens and that's it. You've got all kinds of different things, so they, they could have at least done color palette swaps on them. Could have, or they could have added, like, iconic ones, too, like, uh, the, like Edgar, the giant roach. The giant roach could have been, like, a final boss, maybe. They could have done that, or... A side boss could have been one of those ones. They could have added hints of maybe Alpha was behind this because Alpha is the main villain of the TV series. That would have made the game a bit more, would have made more sense and more appealing, like in my eyes, because that actually would have still kept everything to the universe of Men in Black instead of adding small little, hey, this alien shoots a laser out of its mouth or this one crawls on all fours. Or this one just walks up to you and runs and punches you. That's it. <laughs> and if you know somebody who wants to get into Men in Black, would you hand them this game as a bit of a primer course? I wouldn't hand them this game. There is actually another game that they've made, and I've actually played it. I would probably prefer that game than probably this one specifically. I think it was called Galactic Def No, it's not Galactic Defender. Ah. Uh i had the game with me i i actually ended up losing it <laughs> i forgot which one it was it came out on ps2 specifically and that one actually did have k and j but it was in a third person i forgot the name of it i'll eventually i'll, I'll figure out where what it was the name of but i mean that one specifically had k standard like he had a big he had big guns freaking j had his uh noisy cricket that he's using to attack with and it's just a st straight up just standard third person shooter and that game was actually way more appealing because that they had multiple different types of aliens you're fighting against and it was way more open than it was more linear the way how this game was like that game i would probably recommend more it's a way funner game than this one but it's still that one still has its flaws on top of that i've got to agree um i would definitely hand somebody this game after they've watched the cartoon and after they've watched some of the movies because they can pick up on some of the stuff there but i mean this is visuals for people who already know what they're looking at it's not visuals for people who want to get into something no i i agree with you i would i would definitely want to show them at least the show and then hand them a game but you know make it a give them a good game not this actual like not really monstrosity because it still has it still has like appeal to it on top of that but it's decent enough to know that it still had a low point which is this game to like a high point which is the actual entire series and then other games that came on top of that well okay maybe you can tell them play the first level and then just stop <laughs> i mean i could tell everyone just play the first level actually it does it's very appealing level it's not a bad level granted it's easy as hell but it's still a good level. I honestly, it really is. Like you can go watch a gameplay video of it even on YouTube right now. And it's like 20 minutes long of like from the starting screen all the way to the end of that level. I've actually watched that one recently because I was like, I remember there being a really good level. I honestly thought that level was like towards the middle of the game or towards the end of the game because that actually felt like it should have been there. But the fact that it's the beginning level, 
<laughs> it hit its high point right there. That's what that's what I'm so mad about. Man, that had to have been people saying, getting people to go talk to their friends at school. Oh man, the first level is so good. You need to go buy this game too. Mm -hmm. And then they get to level two, and everybody's mad at you because you got them to buy this game. Yep. Ah oh, man, they they could have done so much just keeping that one level and maybe expanded that level a bit more. And I bet you that game probably would have been great. <laughs> but the uh, the other levels are just not that good. <laughs> Well, Christian, it has been great talking to you about all of this. If people want to hear more from you, where else can they find you around the internet? Yeah, so you can find me. Uh, I'm actually a co-host to a another podcast. It's an anime podcast where me and my buddy both talk about anime, why we love anime, and a bunch of anime news on top of that. It is called the Simping for Senpai podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Radio Public, on Google Podcast. Uh, you can find us on anchor.fm uh, forward slash simping x senpai and then also you can find me on twitter at ash underscore basham you can find the podcast also on twitter at simp x senpai pod and then also if you guys want to you know listen to some of those episodes go on spotify and just share with everyone that you can as always we'll have links to all that down in the show notes because clicking links is so much easier than trying to remember how to spell things Especially when you get into Japanese, because I get I's and E's mixed up in English bad enough. Yeah, that, their language is pretty insane. Uh, just learning in general, it's it's relearning something in general. Like you have to, you have to get rid of the mindset of what you learned in English because in their language, it's n the exact opposite. <laughs> I think I'm going to be happy I decided to go with Russian for my super random, I have no idea why I'm doing this language. Nice, comrade. It is at least kind of grammatically similar to English. I hear you. As always, if you want to hear more from me, head on over to playcomics.com, where you can find links to all the social media stuff, Twitter, Facebook, all that fun stuff. But most importantly, when somebody's listening to this episode in three years, when whatever the next social media darling is... You can find a link there, and my information won't be outdated because I'm just telling you to go to the website. Future proofing. That's the way to do it. If you want us to help support the show, guess where you can go? Also, playcomics.com, where you know you can find a link to Patreon, which is conveniently playcomics.com/slash Patreon, where for just a dollar a month, you get sneak previews of things like a set of videos that I'm working on, that I'm still working on, that to be worked on some more. But if you're a patron, you can say, hey, I'm giving you money. Where's my video? If you're not a patron, then yeah, don't get to say that. Or at least I'm not going to pay attention. Play Comics is part of the Gunna Geek Network, home to other wonderful geeky shows. I even planned out a different word to use this time to describe it, and I still went back to wonderful. So I, I don't know. Maybe that's just the best word for it. If you like the music that I'm rudely talking on top of right now, head on over to soundcloud.com slash best-day to check out Best Day's music. But most of all, just grab a game, grab a stack of comics, and go find yourself a new favorite character. And welcome to Play Comics, where once again... No, actually no, we're finally recording a regular... I'm starting over. There's the outtake! <laughs>